I find it very melodious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you to remain in this of recitation of the Quran for many, many more years and may you, inshallah, inspire so many others, inshallah. Abu Bakr Halan is from Mount View, close by. Adhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. 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 Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa nukminu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. Wa na'udhu billahi min shurur anfusina wa min sayyiat amalina. Ma yahdi illa fala mudillala wa ma yudlilu fala hadiyala. نشهدوا لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهدوا أن محمدا عبده ورسوله قال الله تبارك وتعالى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وأصحابه وبارك وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters in Islam It is my privilege and an honor for me to be able to address you this evening in the company of such illustrious people. I've already mentioned our brother here, Abu Bakr Halant, next to me, the Salih Muhammad, the owner of Rosmid, who has always involved himself, himself in this type of method of spreading the da'wah. And I've had the privilege of serving with him and with our brother Ahmad Didat, we all probably know, is currently ill. May Allah bless him, inshallah, with good health and with long life, inshallah. We also have in the audience a brother from Somalia, Sheikh Abdurrahman Muhammad. Welcome, brother. I trust you will enjoy it as much as we are. I now have the privilege of saying to you that I welcome to Hanover Park, first time around for him, our brother from a place called Dongri in Bombay, Dr. Abdul Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik. The doctor signifies that he is indeed a medical doctor by profession. But he tells me that he has been inspired by the works of our brother Ahmad Dilat and he has taken it upon himself to see that he spreads the deen of Islam in the same manner, perhaps with differences here and there, as Ahmad Dilat. He is currently the president of the Islamic Research Foundation in Dongri, in Bombay. He features every day on the television in India for three hours. With Allah's Qudrat, he has had, according to him, much success. Many people have found him and many people have reverted back to the fold of Islam. But it is nice to have quality people here who will listen attentively and who will suddenly be inspired the way our brother has been inspired in the past. I'm not going to keep you here from my side for too long. We have the topic for tonight, something which we have to listen to very carefully. We either do da'wah work or, we'll have, or we will have to face destruction. As we all know, the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told the people then on his farewell sermon, those of you who are present here today must see that you take the message to those who are not here. 
you did not come to listen to me. We now have the privilege to call upon our brother, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim. Naik, but before I do, do that, I would like to remind you and to inform you if you don't know, and also that you carry the message that tomorrow, inshallah, after the Dr. Naik will be at the Abibia Masjid. Tomorrow evening, after Maghrib, he will be at Masjid al Quds in Gatesville. On Monday evening, is it Ba'd al Isha or Ba'd al Maghrib? Do you know? Ba'd al Isha at York Road Masjid in Lansdowne, Sub Shukru Mubin Masjid. And then on, Maitland, on Monday, after Dhuhr, he will be in Maitland Masjid. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I now hand you with pleasure over to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik of Bombay. Shukran. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnaas. تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شوالي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May peace, blessings and mercy of Almighty Allah be on all of you before we deal with the topic of today, I would like to make a request that as all of you may be aware that Sheikh Ahmed Didal just about two weeks ago he has suffered a very severe stroke and at present he is in a very serious condition. I would request the brothers and sisters that we should make dua that he once again gets back his fitness and health. And at present, he has been flown today morning to Riyadh where he is undergoing treatment at the Riyadh hospital. And we make dua that we once again have Uncle Ahmed Didad back with us. The topic of this evening's talk is dawa or destruction. What do you mean by the word dawa? It is the same as the word dawat. But the moment you hear the word dawat, it reminds you of a lunch party or a dinner party. Dawa does not mean a lunch party or a dinner party. It actually means an invitation. But today, we will not be speaking about an invitation to a lunch party or a dinner party, but we'll be speaking about Dawatul Islam, the invitation to Islam, the invitation to Deen al Haq the religion of truth. An invitation is only given to an outsider. Therefore, dawa is to be done to the non-Muslims. When we speak about Islam to the Muslims, it's called as Islam. But when we preach the message of Islam, or we speak about Islam to the non-Muslim, it is known as Dawah. I start my talk by quoting a verse from the Holy Quran, from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, which says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhidat linnas That, oh, ye are the best of people, you are for mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us Muslims as the Puntum Khaira Ummatin that ye are the best of people, evolve for mankind. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an honor. But always, along with the honor, it is also followed up with responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than the teacher. The teacher has got more honor than the clerk. In the same fashion, the principal has got more responsibility than the teacher. And the teacher has got more responsibility than the clerk. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us Muslims as the kuntum khaira ummatin, that ye are the best of people, evolve for mankind. But natural, we also have a responsibility. The same verse gives the answer. It says, Ta'miruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. That we enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us the kuntum khaira ummatin because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we don't enjoy what is good and if we don't forbid what is wrong, we are not kuntum khaira ummatin. We are not fit to be called the best of people. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. Therefore, according to the Holy Quran, it is compulsory that we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong. That is, we speak to the non-Muslims about Islam, about the good things, and we prevent them and we forbid them from the evil. That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran gives us this honor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143, He says, You are the middlemost community. You are the Ummat al -Wast. You are a justly balanced community. And you have to be a witness over the nations. And the messenger will be a witness over you. It is the duty of every Muslim to be a witness over the other nations. It's compulsory that we speak about Islam to the non-Muslims. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he will be a witness on us on the Day of Judgment. Amongst all the surahs of the Holy Quran, Surah Toba happens to be the most militant surah of the Holy Quran. Why do I say that Surah Toba is the most militant surah of the Holy Quran? Because it's the only chapter of the Holy Quran, it's the only surah which does not begin with the beautiful formula Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Otherwise, if you analyze all the other 113 chapters of the Holy Quran, start with the beautiful formula, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. For example, if you read the Quran, it says, Bismillah rahman rahim Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. Bismillah rahman rahim Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Qul huallahu ahad Every chapter of the Holy Quran begins with a beautiful formula Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of Allah Most gracious, most merciful But Surah Tawbah does not begin with this formula. Why? Because in the Surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a warning and when a warning is given, Bismillah is uncalled for. For example, if suppose you are walking with your wife or with your sister on the road or suppose I am walking with my wife or with my sister on the road and suppose there is a hooligan who snatches away the bag of your wife or of your sister and he runs away. But naturally, you will try and catch him. And if you catch him, you will not say, 
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You will not say in the name of Allah most gracious, most merciful. You will not say Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You will not say may peace be on you. You will get to the topic directly. Hey mister, give the handbag or I'll break your arm. Hey mister, give the handbag or I'll break your neck. You directly get to the subject. Similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Tawbah, when he's giving a warning to the mushriks, to the pagans of Makkah, Bismillah is uncalled for. Because if we read Surah Tawbah, the first four verses, there is a peace treaty between the mushriks of Makkah and the Muslims. And this treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a warning and says, you put things back in place or a declaration of war. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 5 of Surah Tawbah that after the four forbidden months are over, you should fight the pagans of Makkah. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them four months to put things back. Otherwise, a declaration of war. But by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 24, we Muslims, he's addressing us. Now we are in the firing line. And he says in the Holy Quran of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, he says, Pull in Kana Abahu, say, where they be for your fathers, who have now come, or your sons, who are one of them, or your brothers, who are of them, or your spouses, your wives, or your husbands, who are of them, or your relatives. What are your consideration? Your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives. What are your consideration? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking, what are your consideration? Is it your father? See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Isra chapter number 17, verse number 23, that I have ordained for you that you worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you be kind to your parents. After worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, next to it is being kind to your parents. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135, he says, Ya amanu, O you who believe, Stand out firmly for justice and as witness to Allah, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, or the relatives, or the rich and poor. For Allah protects both. That means you have to respect your parents. But if they go against justice, if they go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can even go against them or against your own self. So Allah continues in Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 24, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ أَبَاوْكُمْ وَأَبْنَاوْكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَأَشِرَتُكُمْ Say with it be for your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives. وَأَمْبَالُ نِكْتَرَفْتُمْ مُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَرْشَوْنَا كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُوا تَرْزَوْنَهَا The wealth that he have amassed, the business in which he deal, the houses in which you delight, what are your consideration? The wealth that they have amassed? Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 261 that if you sow one grain in the way of Allah, Allah will give you seven years, each year bearing a hundred grain. That means Allah promises you to give seven hundred times if you invest in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to know which business in this world will give you 700 times profit. That is 70,000 percentage. A profit of 70,000 percent. So Allah says, that the wealth that they have amassed, what are consideration? The business in which you deal, that if I go in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe I will lose business, I will lose my friends. The houses in which you delight, and Allah continues. Ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi That if you love all these things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad in the way of Allah. 
Allah says, Fatarabbasu, you wait. Hatta yahdi Allah hai Until Allah brings about his decision unto you. Until Allah brings about his destruction unto you. Wallahu la yahdi kaum is fasikin. And Allah guides not the perverted transgressors. Allah is telling us Muslims that if you love all these eight things more than Allah, his Rasul, and doing jihad in the way of Allah, Allah says, Fatarabbasu, you wait. And believe me, we Muslims are waiting, sitting on our backside doing nothing. What does Allah mean when He says, wait? What does He mean? Suppose when a teacher, when she is teaching in a class, and she tells the student, when they are reading a book, that look out for a word. The teacher is actually meaning that you should look in the book, not look out of the book. That is the genius of the language. When the teacher says, look out, she's actually meaning the student should look in. Similarly, suppose in a school, there's a senior student who tries to bully a junior student. And the junior student tells the senior student that you wait till I get my elder brother. And the elder brother happens to be the biggest hooligan of that area. So the junior student is actually warning the senior student that you better improve or you will be taught a lesson. When he says, wait till I get my elder brother, he's actually telling him that you buzz off, that you scoot, otherwise you'll be taught a lesson. In the same fashion, when Allah says, Fatarabbasu, Allah says, wait, that means you Muslims, you better improve, otherwise, Destruction will come upon you. Allah is giving a warning. We are in the firing line. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38, he says, Wa in tatamallam, yastabdin kaumun gayrakum, summa laayakun amsalakum. That if you do not do the job, if you turn away from the path, Allah will substitute in your place another people, summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. The Holy Quran says that the people who Allah has given an honor to, if they do not do their job, Allah will substitute in their place another people, summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. If we see history, when you read the Holy Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had chosen the Jews and he delivered the message to the Jews and he chose them as the people to deliver the message. But these Jews, they were too proud. They said, why should we deliver the message to the ignorant people? And if you read the Holy Quran, it's mentioned in Surah Jummah, chapter number 62, verse number 5, that when the Jews were asked to deliver the law of Moses, that the Mosaic law, they did not do the job. Their similitude is like a donkey, like an ass carrying tons of books, but he understands not. So the Jews, the Jews looked down upon the Arabs. These ignorant people, what will they understand the message of God Almighty? It's useless giving the message to them. And if you know history, even the invaders, they bypassed the Arabs. Because the Arabs were looked down upon. It was the days of ignorance. Yom al Jahiliya. It was called the days of ignorance. And the invaders, they did not even feel like ruling Arabia. You know why? Because they were so ignorant, the Arabs. They did the tawaf around the Kaaba absolutely naked. They had a logic. They said that what is a better way to present ourselves to God Almighty than the way in which we came down in this world. So they said that we will do the tawaf around the Kaaba absolutely naked. So the Jews looked down upon the Arabs. And Allah has his ways. When he substitutes the people who are not doing the job, Allah chooses those people who are looked down upon. 
Allah brings those people from the dust and he makes them sit on your head. Allah has his way. Allah has his law. Yes, tab del common care of Allah will substitute in your place and other people. And these people which Allah chooses are the most ignorant people. The people who you look down upon. So Allah later on chose the Arabs. And with the Holy Quran, they became the torch bearers. Allah then chose them, made them the Puntum Khaira Ummatin, the Muslims. But if you see history, whenever we do not do the job, we are substituted. For example, if you know the history of Spain, we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. But we did not do the job. We did not do dawah. When the crusaders came, there was not a single man who, who could openly give the azan. We were wiped out. Why? Because we did not do the job. We did not deliver the message. Allah has his ways. If you do not do the job, Allah will substitute in your place and other people. Summa laikun amsalukum and they will not be like you. We Muslims, we say that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anyone in the world. We love Him the maximum. We love Him more than a father, more than a mother, more than our family members. We love Him the maximum. But do we actually believe in what we say? Suppose your neighbor, if he abuses your mother, or if he abuses your sister and if you get back home and when you come to know that he has abused your sister or your mother, what will you do? You will see to it that you teach the neighbor a lesson. If you physically cannot do it yourself, what will you do? You will hire someone else to do the job. You see to it that your neighbor is taught a lesson. He's put in his place. Why? Because we love our mother. We love our sister. We respect our mother. But if you read the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is crying. He is crying out in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 88. He cries out, وَقَالُوا تَقَذُّ الرَّحْمَانُ وَالَدَى That they say, the Christians, that Allah was gracious, has begotten a son. Indeed, it's a most monstrous thing to say that Allah has begotten a son. Allah says that they say, the, the Christians, that Allah has begotten a son. Indeed, it's a most monstrous thing to say. وَقَالُوا تَقَذُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَا لَقَدْ جِدْتُمْ شَيْءًا إِدَّا تَقَادُ السَّمَوَاتُ يَتَفَتَّنَّا مِنْهُ As though the skies are ready to burst وَتَنَشَكُ الْأَرْضُ And the earth to split asunder وَتَخِرُ الْجِبَالُ حَدَّا And the mountains to fall down to utter ruin Imagine when they say that Allah has begotten a son as though the skies are ready to burst the earth to split open and the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. That they should say that Allah most gracious has begotten a son. Imagine, it's the biggest abuse you can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But believe me, our neighbors, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our neighbors, they say that Allah has begotten a son. But believe me, nothing is happening to us Muslims. Why? We say we love Allah more than our mother, more than our sister. When someone abuses our sister or our mother, we get agitated. We want to teach the neighbor a lesson. But when the neighbor abuses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do not interfere. It is not affecting us a little bit. Our Christian neighbor, he says that according to the Bible, in the Gospel of John, Chapter number 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. 
shall not perish but have everlasting life. They say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the begotten Son of God. But are we making any effort to correct our Christian brothers? Have we ever told them to explain the meaning of the word begotten? They say that according to the first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And they say, and they believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Have we ever told them that what they believe is wrong? Have we ever told what the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171? Quran says, Don't say Trinity. This is stop it, it's better for you. Have we ever opened our mouth? Have we made an effort to connect them? We say that we love Allah more than anyone in the world. But do we actually mean it? We look around us. There are our Hindu brothers. They say that Allah has begotten a son. But have we made any effort to correct them? They call us for festivals. And you may be knowing about the common festival that is Ganesh Chaturthi. It's specially celebrated in Maharashtra, the place where I come from. And they call us for puja. And many of our brothers, the Muslims, they go for the puja and they even have the offering which they make to God Almighty, their so-called God Almighty. That is, they have the prasad. The Quran clearly gives you the message in no less than four different places. In Surah Bakra chapter number 2, verse number 173. In Surah Maira chapter number 5, verse number 3. In Surah Anam chapter number 6, verse number 145. And in Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 115, it says, Hurramat alaykum ul maitu tu wad dammu wa rahmat khanzeel. Wa ma ahuilla li gare lapi. That's forbidden for you for food, ah? Dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which the name of anyone besides Allah has been taken. The Quran forbids you from having any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked in no less than four different places. And when the Hindus, when they give us the prasad, we go to the function, we go to the puja, and we even have the prasad. We are testifying, we are giving shahada to them that we believe Allah has begotten a son. Imagine, it's a shame on us. Allah is crying in the Quran that it's the most worst abuse we can give to him. And we Muslims, many of our brothers, we go to the functions and we testify that what they are saying is absolutely correct. We say that how can we hurt the feelings of our friend? How can we hurt the feeling? I mean we have to live with them in harmony. So we are giving shahada that Allah has begotten a son. Have you ever made an effort to correct them? It is so easy. You can yet keep a good relationship with them and correct them. The only thing you have to do when you go to the puja of Ganesh Chaturthi, you have to ask him that my dear brother, who is this Ganesh? Who is this Ganesh? So the Hindu friend will tell you that Lord Ganesh, he is the son of Lord Shiva. That means Lord Shiva has a son by the name of Lord Ganesh. One day when Shiva, when he had gone on expedition, for long expedition, his wife Parvati, she takes out dirt from her body and she makes a son. And one day she tells the son that, see, I am resting in the house. You guard the entrance of the house and don't allow anyone to come into the house because I don't want to be disturbed. And this thing takes place when Lord Shiva is away on expedition. At that moment, Lord Shiva comes back to the house. And when he's about to enter the house, this Lord Ganesh, he stops his father and he says that you cannot enter the house. My mother is resting. 
I mean, this thing is told to you by a Hindu friend. You don't have to tell him this. He will tell you when you ask him, who is this Lord Ganesh? He will describe to you the story of Lord Ganesh. So the son of Parvati, he stops Shiva from entering the house and says that my mother is resting. Lord Shiva, he gets infuriated. He gets wild. That who is this young boy trying to stop me from entering my own house? He's so angry that he chops off the head of his own son. Imagine, you have to ask him the question. That when your Lord Shiva, he cannot identify his own son, how will he identify me? When your God cannot identify his own son, how will he identify me? And the story continues, that the head was chopped off so hard that it goes away miles, thousands of miles. So when he realizes his mistake, Lord Shiva, he says that the first animal you come across, chop off the head of that animal and bring that head to me. So the first animal they come across is an elephant. So they chop off the head of the elephant and Lord Shiva takes the head of the elephant and he puts it onto the body of a son and you have a hybrid, an elephant man. And this person is called Lord Ganesh. So you ask him, that do you worship such a god? Then the Hindu friend will tell him, see, this is all mythology. It's mythology. These are fairy tales. See, we are in a modern world. You have to tell him that, brother, do you believe in this? He will tell you, no, no, this is only mythology. You tell him that, see, brother, I want to have that prasad, but you prove to me that Lord Ganesh is God. You prove to me and I will have it. He will say, these are fairy tales. He will say, Daniel, you don't have that prasad. You have to educate him. You have to do the job. You have to do the job with hikmah. You don't have to insult him. You don't have to abuse him. You have to ask simple questions, innocent questions, and that will do the job. Because the Holy Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that revile not those people who worship God besides Allah. Abuse not those people who worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance they will revile Allah. They will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have to abuse them. You have to ask them questions and they themselves will realize that how illogical the belief is. If you read the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 120, it says, Walan Tarda, Ankal Yahudu, Walan Nasara, Hatta Tatabiyu Millatikum. That means the Jews and Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. And Allah tells you in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, he says that they say, وَقَالُوا لَا يَذْكُرُ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدَنُ النَّسَارَةَ The Jews and Christians, they will tell you that you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah until you become a Jew or a Christian. They come knocking at our door and they tell us that you Muslims, with your Tawheed, with your Salah, with your Zakah, with your fasting, with your Hajj, you shall never enter Jannah until you become Jew or Christian. They are challenging us. Allah says, Tilka amani yuhu. This is the wishful thinking. This is the bakhwas. Qul hatu burhanakum. Tell them, produce your proof. In kuntum sadiqin. But if you're truthful, we have to ask them to produce their proof. If they speak the truth. And believe me, they have produced their proof. That is the Holy Bible. They say, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. And they have produced the Holy Bible in no less than 2,000 different languages. What language you understand? The Bible is there in that language. They have produced the Burhan. What do we have to do? Do we have to follow it hook, line and sinker? When anyone produces his proof, what do we do? You verify the proof. You verify the identity. 
So we have to read the Bible and check whether the Burhan is truthful or not. Have we done it? Believe me, these Christian missionaries, they read, they read our Quran and they are making life miserable for us. They come knocking at our doors throughout the world, in every part of the world, they come knocking at our doors and they say, that see, it is mentioned in your Holy Quran that the Bible is the word of God. I mean, most of us Muslims will, be, will say yes. The Holy Quran says that Bible is the word of God. So the next question is, why don't you follow the Bible? Believe me, we have no answer. They come knocking at our doors and they say that your beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, he is mentioned by name in the Holy Quran only five times. But the name of Jesus peace be upon him is mentioned 25 times. Who is greater? These missionaries, they don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They don't give you the answer. They only pose the question, who is greater? And they pose the next question. That Muhammad peace be upon him, he had a mother and father? We Muslims will say yes, he had a mother and a father. Did Jesus peace be upon him? Did he have a father? We say no. Yes, he had a mother. Mother Mary, may Allah be pleased with her. But we believe that he was born without any male intervention. He had no father. So who is the father of Jesus peace be upon him? They ask the question. They don't give the answer, but they let your mind think. Who is greater? A person who has a father and mother, or a person who has a mother but no father. Who's greater? They ask you the question, but they don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They come knocking at our doors. They say that, did your beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, did he give life to the dead? We say yes, we believe in many of the miracles, but we don't know of any in which he gave life to the dead. Did Jesus peace be upon him according to you? Did he give life to the dead? We say yes, it's mentioned in the Quran. He said, Bismillah, wake up in the name of Allah. So who's greater? Who's greater of the two? They don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They use as Muslims as a punching bag. They use as Muslims as the doormats. They keep on posing questions. They ask the question that your beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon you. Is he dead or alive? You say, see, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is Hayatul Nabi. Spiritually, he is alive. But there is no physically, is he dead or alive? We have to agree that physically he is dead. He is buried in Medina. Jesus, peace be upon him. Is he dead or alive? We believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was raised up alive. So who is greater? They ask you the question. They don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They are using us as punching bags, as doormats. We are scapegoats. And believe me, we are supposed to be the people who are supposed to dawah, to propagation. But these people, they are so dedicated, even with the falsehood, they are so firm. The maximum missionaries that we find in any religion is in Christianity. They are making life miserable for us. What are we to do? Shouldn't we make an effort to correct these people? And Quran gives you a way how to do the job. The answer to all these questions is given clearly in the Holy Quran. But how many of us read the Quran with understanding? The Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. It says, Qul, ya ahil al-kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayna no baynukum, that come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'muda illa Allah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi, that we associate the partners with Him. Wala yataqiza bazuna bazan arbaban min dunillah, that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawallah. 
if then they turn back. Faqulu shadu. Say we bear witness. We are not Muslimun, that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the Holy Quran of Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, is a master key for dawah. It shows you a way how to do dawah with the Ahli Kitab, with the Jews and Christians. If it works for the Hindus, use it. If it works for the Sikhs, use it. It's a master key. It says, that come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'muda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi. That we associate to partners with Him. We have to open our mouths. We have to do the job. But we Muslims, we are intelligent. We are intelligent in making excuses. We say, that see, I don't have enough knowledge. We pass the baton. That since we don't have enough knowledge, we are not the fittest people to do dawah. Dawah is somebody else's job. Our beloved Prophet said, Balligo anni walamaya. That propagate even if it be one verse. Means even if you know one verse about Islam, it's your duty to propagate it. I want to know that which Muslim in this world does not know one verse about Islam. <coughs> Every Muslim, he has to at least know one verse about Islam. He at least has to know, La ilaha illallah, that there is no God but Allah. Whatever he knows, it's his duty to convey the message to those people who do not know it. See, we go to the mosque and we pray and when we pray, our Imam, he reads after Surah Fatiha in the Salah, he reads, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say is Allah one and only, Allahu samad, Allah the absolute, the eternal, lam yalim wa lam yulad, he begets not nor is he begotten, wa lam yakul lahu kufanad, and there is nothing unto him like in this world. The Qari is saying, the Imam, he's reading, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say he's Allah one and only. I want to know that the Muslims that come in the mosque, do they not believe that Allah is one and only? Of course they believe. So what is the message we are getting in our Salah? We are getting the message that Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say he's Allah one and only. We have to go out and say to those people who do not believe that God is one, we have to tell them that God is one irrespective whether you can convince them or not. Your job is to deliver the message. The Quran says in Surah Ghashiyah, chapter number 88, verse number 21, فَزَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُزَكِّرْ That your job is to deliver the message. Your job is to do zikr. Whether they accept or not, you leave it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your job is to deliver the message. Whatever you know, if you know there is one God, tell your non-Muslim friend that there is one God, there is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he asks you for proof, how can you prove that there is one God? How can you prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now the moment you do not know the answer, what do you do? You come home and you do the homework. You find out the answer. That how can you prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can you prove that there is one God Almighty? And believe me, now you don't have to do much of research. Everything is available on your fingertips. Now science and technology has advanced. I had given a talk a few months ago in Bombay on is the Quran the word of God? And I've proved logically and scientifically, even to the atheist, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You only have to get the answer and repeat it. The moment you find the answer, and when you tell your friend that, see, this is the answer how you can prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can you prove that there is one God Almighty? And after he's convinced, you are a master of one question. Then you go to the next part. That, see, you have to offer the salah. He said, what is the proof? What is the proof that the Muslims, the way you Muslims offer salah is right? If you don't know the answer, you come home and you do your homework. 
you can prove logically and scientifically that the way the Muslims pray is the best. You can prove to the Christian from his Bible that the way we offer Salah is the right way. Now you are a master of two questions. Then tell him, you should not have four. He'll ask you, what proof do you have? Why do you say that we should not have four? If you don't know the answer, you'll come back and do the homework. Now you are a master of three questions. In this way, your knowledge increases. You don't have to wait till you become like Sheikh Didal or some great speaker and, and then you say that now I'll do Dawa. A prophet said, Balligu anni walabaya. Propagate even if you know one verse about Islam. You have to start immediately. You can't wait for tomorrow. But there are Muslims who give several excuses for not delivering the message. They say that, see, first we Muslims, we should improve our own Muslim brothers. And then after our Muslim brothers are improved, then we should go and speak to the non-Muslim. First, we have to make the Musliman Fakka Musliman. We'll make the Muslim a good Muslim and afterwards we will deliver the message to the non-Muslim. Believe me, that time will never come. That time will never come. It's impossible to make all the Muslim Fakka Musliman. Our beloved Prophet could not do that. Believe me, he delivered the message to his family members. He could not he could not convince his own uncle. His own uncle did not accept Islam. Do you think you're better than the Prophet? No, first we have to improve our own people. Then deliver the message to the other people. Do you know the reason why they say this? Because it's easy. If I tell a Muslim that brother you should offer Salah, even if he does not pray, he will not retaliate. He will listen to you quietly. Bhai sahab, die the foe. Keep a beard. Even if he does not like it, he will not retaliate. Give your zakah. Even if he's not giving, he will not retaliate. But if you speak about Islam to the non-Muslim, there will be a reaction. There may be a retaliation. So we want to do the easy job. We want to choose. We don't do the job. We want to choose the easy part and we pass the on and we give excuses for not delivering the message. Our beloved Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, as mentioned by the chairman, in the farewell pilgrimage he said, there were more than 110,000 Sahabas, companions of the beloved Prophet, and he asked them that did you get the message and all of them unanimously said, Beishak, yes, we got the message. Then the Prophet said, all those who are present here, you have to deliver the message to those who are not present here. And believe me, there were less than 10,000 Sahabas who were buried in Arabia. More than 100,000 Sahabas went outside Arabia for what? For making Musliman Pakka Musliman? For delivering the message to the non-Muslims? For doing da'wah? And even at the time of the Prophet, when the Prophet lived in Medina, it's mentioned in the hadith that our prophet said there were many Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregation. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, that they did not come for the Jummah Salah to the mosque. The prophet felt like burning their houses. That means even at the time of the prophet, there were Muslims who were not good Muslims. They did not come for the compulsory congregation. They did not come for the Jummah Salah. But still, our beloved Prophet, he sent letters to the various non-Muslim kings, the king of Abyssinia, the king of Egypt, and various letters. Many of the kings even tore the letter and trampled it. But still, he delivered the message. What we have to do is we have to do both simultaneously. We have to speak to the Muslims about Islam and simultaneously give the message to the non-Muslims. We have got no excuse for not doing a job. 
Then there are other people who say, let's see the Quran says that Lakun Dinu Kumaliyadin. To use your way to me is mine. Therefore, we should not force anyone. It's, the Quran says it's not required to preach the religion. Quran gives us a clear statement. Lakun Dinu Kumaliyadin. To use your way to me is mine. To use your religion to me is my religion. Therefore, Dawah is not required. See, these people are quoting the Holy Quran out of context. What they are referring to is the verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Kafirun, chapter number 109, verse number 6. But they are quoting out of context. For the complete context, you have to start from verse number 1, which says, Qul ya ayyuhal kafiruna, la abudu ma ta'buduna, wa la antum abiduna ma abud, wa la ana abidu ma abadtum, wa la antum abiduna ma abud, la kundinukum wal yaddin. Which means, that say to those who reject faith, I worship not that which you worship. You will not worship that which I have been worshipping. I will not be worshipping that which you want me to worship, nor will you worship that which I worship. To use your way to me is mine. First you have to deliver the message. It says, Qul ya ayyuhal kafiruna. Say to those who reject faith, the question of rejecting the faith only comes after you deliver the message. If you have not delivered the message, where is the question of rejecting the faith? If they are not Muslims, why should we force Islam on them? Again, they are quoting out of context. What they are referring to is the verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2. Verse number 256, we say, din, There is no compulsion religion, but truth stands out clear from error. Those who hold the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will take him from darkness to light. Those who hold the hand of the evil one, he will take you from light into darkness. Complete the verse. Just don't say there is no compulsion religion. Along with it, you should say, Truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth. If they don't accept the truth, then you don't have to force it down the truth. Forcing Islam at the point of the sword, at the point of the gun, it's useless. But still, you have to deliver the message. After you have delivered the message, if they do not agree with the truth, you have to say, like Rafiddin, there is no compulsion religion, truth stands out clear from error. But still, we Muslims, we don't want to do the job. You know, we are afraid that if we deliver the message, we will make enemies. We will lose our friends, we will lose our business, we will lose our wealth. And they give excuses. Let's see, religion, deen, it's a personal belief. It's something personal. Therefore, you should not interfere with things which are personal. If we speak about religion, it will hurt the other person's feeling. It's too personal. Therefore, we have to believe in our personal belief and let them believe in their personal belief. It's too personal. We should not speak about religion. I would just like to give them an example. That suppose you go along with your family, along with your wife and, and along with the small children to a hill station. Say you're going to Table Mountain. And after you have gone to Table Mountain, while you are chatting with your wife, or while you're having some snacks with your wife, your small son, who's hardly two and a half years old, he slips away from you and he goes far away. He goes so far away that by the time you realize that he has gone away from you, he's already gone several hundreds of meters away from you. And there you see that he is going towards the cliff, towards the end of the Table Mountain. And there you find that the elderly gentleman, he is standing with his hand folded just next to the cliff and he is admiring the beauty. And you can see your son walking towards him. When you see that your son is going to fall from the cliff, he is too far. Even if you shout, it will not help. But you see the elderly gentleman, he's standing at the edge of the cliff and he's minding his own business. 
he sees your son coming close to him and he sees that your son is going to fall over but still he is a silent spectator and after a while your son steps over the cliff and he falls and he dies what will you do will you come and congratulate the old man oh jazakallah you are minding your own business what will you do you will blame him you will blame him that see that elderly gentleman he had the knowledge he had the intelligence he could have easily stopped my son he didn't even have to take a step forward he was so close he only had to stretch his hand and my son would have been saved but he was minding his own business believe me he did not ask your son to jump over the cliff he did not push your son but still you will blame that elderly gentleman because you say that my son was masoom he was innocent he was not aware that if he takes a step forward he will die he was masoom he did not have the knowledge what was that elderly gentleman doing will you say that okay thank you for minding your own business no you will blame him that it's his fault he could have saved my son in the same way when we muslims we can see that these mushriks they are going to hell they are going to jahannam and if we are silent spectators we will be accounted we will not go scot free suppose you have a non muslim neighbor and if he died as a mushrik on the day of judgment allah subhanahu wa taala will ask him will ask that non muslim that did you get the message of islam and he will say no i didn't get it so allah will tell him that was his job and allah says in the holy quran in surah fusilat chapter number 41 verse number 33 سنريهم اياتنا في الافاق وفي انفسهم حتى يتبين لهم ان الحق that soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their soul until it is true to them that this is the truth allah shows a sign it was the duty of the non muslim to find the truth signs were shown truth was shown to him if he did not accept the truth it fell fall he will go to hell then allah will question you next did you muslim did you deliver the message to your non muslim friend and if you say no you will follow him you will follow him it is your fard it is your duty to do dawa to deliver the message of islam you will not be forgiven you will have no excuse to save yourself because allah clearly mentions in the holy quran in surah al asr chapter number 103 verse number 1 to 3 the four criteria for salvation are given it says wal as by the token of time wal as innal insana lafi khus illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bis sabr allah is taking an oath that by the token of time man is verily in a state of loss allah takes several oaths in the holy quran but the never say to of the victory of the olive of the stars of the mountains but here allah is taking one of the biggest oath wal as by the token of time by the fleeting time man is verily in loss man is in khasara man is in loss wal as innal insana lafi khus illa alladhina amanu except those who have faith wa amilu salihati those of righteous deed wa tawassaw bil haqq wa tawassaw bis sabr and those who exhort people to the truth those who do isla and dawa and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance the holy quran says that man is in a state of loss except those people who fulfill these four criteria that is iman having faith salihati righteous deed wa tawassaw bil haqq exhorting people to truth what was so be sub exhorting people to patience and perseverance believe me if any of these four criteria are missing you shall not enter jannah you may be a very good muslim you may be a pious muslim you may have faith you may offer your salah you may give zakah every lunar year in the month of ramadan you fast you may perform the hajj but if you don't do dawah if you don't deliver the message 
if you don't do isla and dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. All four criteria are required. If any one of these four is missing, that is faith, righteous deed, dawah or isla, exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four is missing, you shall not enter Jannah. That's the guidance we get in the Holy Quran. And if you read, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 104, that let there arise out of you a group of people who enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong. And these are the ones to attain felicity. This verse of the Holy Quran speaks about full time dies. The earlier verse which I quoted of Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 110, and Surah Al Asad, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, it was talking that every Muslim should do dawah, minimum, should at least be a part time dying. You have to compulsory, you have to dawah. But this verse of the Holy Quran talks about full time dying. Let there arise out of you a group of people enjoying what is good and forbidding what is wrong. These are the ones to attain felicity. How we are full time doctors, full time engineers, full time advocates. How many full time dyes do we have? We can hardly count them on our fingertips. Doing dawa part time is compulsory for every Muslim. But amongst the Muslim Ummah, there should be few people. There should be a group who should be full time dyes. And it's the duty of the rest of the Ummah to support these dyes. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, that who is better in speech than the person who invites to the way of thy Lord? Who is better? And the Holy Quran, Allah gives a promise in the Holy Quran. Allah says in no less than three different places. Allah says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, and in Surah Saf, Chapter number 61, verse number 9, he says, Huwa allazi arthra rasoolahu bilhuda wa dinu al-haq liyazhirahu ala dinu kulli wa kafa billahi shayda. That we have sent the messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the dinu al-haq, Islam, the religion of truth, will prevail over all the other ways of life. Kulli, all the other ways of life. Whether it be communism, secularism, Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam is destined to supersede all, to master them all, to overcome them all. Kulli! Walaukari al-Mushrikun. However much the Mushrik don't like it, however much the idol worshippers don't like it. The similar message is given with a different ending in Surah Fatah. Chapter number 48, verse number 28, where it says, Huwa allazi asra rasoolahu bilhuda wa dinu al-haq liyazhira wa al-deen kulli wa khafa billahi shayda. That we have sent the messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. Whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, secularism, Islam is destined to supersede all, to master them all, to overcome them all. And enough is Allah the witness. Wakafa billahi shayda. Allah is giving witness. Allah is giving a promise that His deen will prevail over all the other ways of life, with or without you, with or without me. The rubbish that we are. What are we? Nothing. With or without me, with or without you, whether we do dawah or not, Allah does not require us to make his deed prevail over all the other ways of life. He does not require us. He is giving us an opportunity. He is giving us an opportunity. Make hay while the sun is shining. See, we know that Islam is going to prevail over all the other ways of life. When we know, we should do the job. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and to earn a prophet's reward. I would like to end my talk by quoting the verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, it says, Udu wal mawzat al hasna That is, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them. 
and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Wa akhirat da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Shukran. Shukran jazeelan, doctor. I listened very attentively for most of the time, other than the time when I was writing. I would like to make use of this opportunity of saying that I've had the privilege of serving with Ahmad Didat since 1984. The opportunity came quite by accident and I was very scared and very skeptical. I didn't know the scene. I was asked by Brother Saleh Muhammad. And when he comes to Cape Town, as you may know, he does his rounds from the city hall right down to Rocklands in, and in Mitchell's Play and other quarters, Hanover Park, Weinberg, you name it. I've always felt, what happens when Ahmad Dida leaves the scene? I'm no longer afraid. We have people, even in South Africa, who have taken it up. I now ask people in the audience here, if there's anything that you're not clear on, on what was said tonight, not what was said last week, tonight, then please come up to the microphone. We even welcome our sisters, please. To so come and put your question, and if you have another question and there happens to be a queue, then after your question and has been asked and answered, then go to the back of the queue. And please give the people ample time to put their question. And don't shout the person down. Let him ask whatever question he wants to. We now ask people to come forward and put questions so that you do not leave here with half the story. Shukran. Thank you.